over 7 million different animals inhabit our planet. Records of a tiger dragging a 700 kilogram, 700 kilogram uh, guar bull. What can they teach us? And it's the ecological benefits of tigers to farmers in reducing crop and livestock losses in the eastern Himalayas. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Yeah, not chuffing this time on part two. Not yet, at least. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. So we're back talking about tigers. You know, we, again, for the listeners, we, we really, these iconic species, Angie and I decided we wanted to really spend more time, do a little bit more research. I've got some good studies to cover, like in part one, to talk more in depth about this species because this is actually one of people's favorites. I mean, just they love tigers. Oh, throughout just, history, amazing. yes. I mean, our generation, but many millennia before us, they have humans and tigers have interacted in a very dynamic and interesting way. So they're feared by some, beloved by many. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, they're worthy. We're going to try to do them the justice and we'll still probably fail. <laughs> <laughs> fail at it. I know. I know. There's I'll such try. an amazing, beautiful big cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that I love them even more after learning about their physiology and some of their behavior. And of course, as we touched on in episode one, and we'll really get to the nuts and bolts today about their conservation and that these big, beautiful, mm -hmm. the biggest cat mm -hmm. in the world uh, in Asia, different parts of Asia is uh, mm -hmm. endangered and really need an, needing right. our help. Right, right. And again, I got to play with my little kitty, Jay, my little tiger. And I told my friend, Julie, that this episode's coming. So she's really excited. So shout out to them, you know, for tigers. And we had, a, you know, a lot of people have been wanting this episode for a while. So again, two-parter, do them justice. Just to recap, there are nine subspecies of tiger. Three are extinct, the Bali tiger, the Javan tiger, and the Caspian tiger. Then you have the other six subspecies that are struggling, and we're going to kind of get into the conservation here in a, in a little while. I hope you enjoyed the, enjoyed the interview. If you have not listened to it yet, please listen to Angie's interview with a scientist in the field studying these animals. And, and you said he, he treks deep into the jungle to up, find his camera traps, right? Up to two weeks, Chris. Yeah, that's insane. Oh, that's insane. But what, what a, he's awesome. Yeah, Chris. So when we talk about conservation heroes, this interview really depicts the lengths that uh, the World Wildlife Fund and their team goes to in order to help learn more about tigers and their population and their behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's just incredible. It's just, it was very, very eye-opening to me. Um, and hopefully the listeners will learn something. I know I learned a lot during it. And I, of course I've made a new friend in Indonesia. I know. So that it I wants know. us to come visit. So I know <laughs> it's awesome. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And it's, you know, it, it's just a fun species to cover. And, and again, like we said, please share this episode. You can follow us on Instagram, all creatures podcast, like us on Facebook, uh, go to the Facebook group, all creatures group. Now that we have, we can just do some discussions on tigers, the conservation and, and things that are in the news. So, so check us out there. Now you want to stay tuned because not only is Angie going to tell us if they purr or not, but I had a question because I've heard this before that in Asia, people walking through the forests and jungles will actually wear a mask backwards. So a human face on the back of their head, because the belief is tigers won't attack you. They only attack you from behind. So is that true? Is that a good strategy? You know, and you're looking at me like, no, <laughs> you're shaking your head. No, I'll let you know if it works or not. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you know. Uh, okay. I'm I've excited. seen this before. I've seen this before. And then another big announcement this week, we have an interview with Rob Lang from Underdone Comics, who we've been collaborating with lately. Amazing guy. Like I'm just, he's, he's a new friend. It's so, it's so fun. We meet so many new people. Well, and I have a and feeling, I'm a hypothesize. This could be a really funny episode because he has a, an amazing, yeah. somewhat dark, <laughs> but also hilarious <laughs> yes, humor. sense of humor. So humor. yeah, it'll be great. He does. 
He does. Oh, he's amazing. It was fun talking to him and he's going to come down to California and we're going to go, we talk about it. We're going to go clean the beach together because I was there uh, last weekend. Absolutely. Well, there's this great, there's this awesome challenge of, uh, I think it's moving through like teenage and college and you, you boys are right there, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, generation, the younger generation of Mm -hmm. doing before and afters of, uh, littered places. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. amazing what you can it's do amazing. in 30 minutes, Chris, you know, yeah. and how and much social media, the power of social mm-hmm. media mm-hmm. and then sharing that and then people liking it and it's contagious. And so, yeah, I'll be looking for that selfie from you guys, the before and the after. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll, okay. But we'll have one little bag. No, I'm just kidding. I can see people with like these trash bags, <laughs> me and Rob out there with our little bag. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into some tiger facts. And, you know, we left off talking to John, your your wonderful husband. You guys chuffing away, you know, every day with your kids running around the house. It's, it's just too cute. The Some really fun facts about tigers, Angie, and there's so much that you can just go dig and get lost in. But one of the things about that always surprised me about big cats is in predators, they only live 10 to 15 years. I always thought predators live forever, you know, like 30, 40, 50 years. No, no, it's a hard, harsh, hard. We did this in lions, right? Most male lions die by the age of two. It's a hard life for a big cat out in the wild. It's hard. Oh yes, Chris. It's definitely hard for those guys. And and we'll talk about it when we get into uh, reproduction and offspring, but this learning, this hunting skill set, this niche of how to be a predator takes time and nurturing from the mother and, and a while to learn these skills. And as you said, sometimes even that's not enough to protect them from being picked off mm-hmm. until they're fully grown. And, and then with that, yeah, 10 to 15 years I live. Uh, there has been reports of up to 26 years in the wild. Uh, so there is some, some flexibility with that, but that's a very rare occasion. So no, mm-hmm. not, not mm-hmm. like some of our herbivore friends, like the elephants that, uh, live for a really mm-hmm. long time. Yeah. Yeah. Or sea turtles, sea turtles, turtles that, reptiles, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or some birds. So yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Now, some of the fun physiology, that that I learned is the tiger's hind legs are actually longer than their front legs. Yeah. So yeah. And that gives them the ability to leap like up to 30 feet in one jump, like three stories high. That's nuts. Yes. Three stories, not two, not 20 feet or 10 feet, 30 feet. (laughs) So our little domestic cats, you watch them leap and you see their leaping ability for the little bodies. Just multiply that by, you know, I don't know what, like, like 10. <laughs> and that's how far tigers can jump. Yeah. I think, like, I mean, they're, nuts. they're just, yeah. well, they're just, and they're just such powerful animals. There's, well, they're powerful in the hind end, but also in the front end, there's uh, records of a tiger dragging a 700 kilogram, 700 kilogram, uh, guar bull. So they, they're huge. Yeah. They have a huge short, Thick necks, broad shoulders, these massive forelimbs that, of course, are ideal for holding onto the prey with the long retractable mm-hmm. claws and then, then the four pads, four paws. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. The physiology. I mean, just, just the, the cat physiology is just fun. Now, did you see how fast they can run? If you can't outrun a tiger. There's no way. No way. Yeah. No that, I, uh, yeah. Hopefully I'm never in that predicament. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so they can run as fast as 40 miles per hour or 65 kilometers per hour, which is booking. That is booking. That is fast. That is super fast. Well, and Chris too, it's also really interesting. You've been talking about Jake. And of course I have my, mm-hmm. my little domestic tiger, Phoenix and bear mm-hmm. bear. And when they lick me, it's often annoying mm-hmm. and it hurts. Yes. Yes. So imagine this. With a tiger, they their tongue similarly is covered with these hard papillae to mm. literally scrape flesh off the bones of prey. So take what your cat does to you and that annoyance factor and multiply <laughs> it by what, a hundred? <laughs> I mean at least at least Phoenix isn't taking off my 
skin of my finger when she's licking me. But that's what he's thinking. That's what John said. Your cats are thinking about eating. Oh you. yeah. Oh for so sure. That's what they're trying to do. We know. We know if one of us goes down, the cats are coming for us for sure. <laughs> but but no, the dog oh, would ward him off. The dog would be like, "No, don't yeah. eat my mom. Don't. No, no. <laughs> gypsy don't girl. Oh, my gypsy dad. Yeah, she's, she's such she's a lover." Like, yes. Yeah, she is. She is. So that's good. That's good. Gets us right into nutrition. And I have a really good paper here coming up in a second that I'm going to cover again, some of the the scientific data that we wanted to present with the species. It, you know, tigers mainly hunt deer, boar, buffalo. You talked about the, the gar. Anything, antelope. anything's with hoofs and horns. <laughs> My t- yeah, team, they'll eat. team ungulate. Any, any Darn of these it. favorites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But they will eat, sometimes they'll eat small birds, uh, an elephant, if they can get it. So an Asian elephant or even some bears. Right. You know, yeah. Some, I know, mean, they're a carnivore, don't. but they're also a little bit of what they call an opportunist. So they're not going to mm-hmm. turn their nose up to fish or it's been documented mm-hmm. porcupine, rats, frogs, yeah. oh, pheasants. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, you mentioned Asiatic black bear. So yeah, yeah they're... And it's interesting... I was going to say, it's interesting you, you, you talk about them fishing. I, I forgot to mention, this is the only cat that loves water. Loves water. Love yes. Yes. They love it. They're great yeah. swimmers. So, yeah. And when you see them under human care, there's always a water feature because the tigers love them. Mm-hmm. They, they love to swim and bask in the water. So one of the few cats that, that did, well, probably the only big species, even though some lions will hunt in water in the, in the swamps of Africa or some of the wetlands there. Now, John mentioned this in part one, tigers have a really low success rate in hunting. And if we go back to our lion episode, you know, 20, 30 episodes ago, and we talked some lions, you know, we looked at the data were 30, 35% successful in their hunts. But remember, they're hunting as a pride. This is a solitary hunt. So the tigers adapted, they've got these huge paws that soft pads. So they creep through the brush or to ambush uh, their prey, but they're only successful about 10% of the time. Yes. So one, one out of 10 or 20. One, yeah. yeah. Or 20. Yeah. Even, you know, less than that at mm-hmm. 5%. Mm-hmm. So not very good um, for them. It's just hard. It's just really hard. Now, when they do hunt, like I said, people put the, the mask behind their head because when they hunt, they come from behind and they bite the head right behind the neck. That's how they take down their prey. So we see lions doing the opposite, coming underneath generally to cut off air supply. Tigers will actually come behind and bite the neck um, to kill their play. Well, their, yeah, kill their prey. And I think that's the predominant way, but I was actually reading that's typically more for smaller prey weighing less than half mm-hmm. of the way of the tiger. Uh, Mm -hmm. because the canines will be inserted into the neck vertebrae and basically Mm -hmm. breaking the spinal cord. However, for large animals, they will often actually bite the throat and that's, they will go underneath mm -hmm, and that's to crush the animal's trachea and suffocate it. Yeah. And the throat bite is definitely a safer killing tactic because it minimizes the assault or the damage that can be done to the tiger while he's attacking the prey. But that throat attack once again, is for a larger prey. And I don't know how often they come across or how often they dare to go for that larger prey. I couldn't find any statistics on that. Yeah. And they, and they usually are nocturnal hunters. They, their night vision is very superior. It's like six times better than ours. So they've, they've got really great eyes to, to see at night and they'll stalk through the brush and then pounce on their prey. And in, in a single meal, they, they can eat up to, on average, 12 pounds, 5 kilograms. I have saw some data. They can eat up to 60 pounds, which is a ton, or 27 kilograms. Generally, they'll, they'll eat smaller meals, bury it, and then come back and eat it for a period of days. Because it's feast or famine for them. You know, it's, it's, it's truly, truly tough. And Chris, I was reading a, a study, too, by uh, Mel Sunquist from the early 2000s that showed after the prey is taken down, a tiger will sometimes leave or reject some parts of the animal, depending on the species and the part. But like, as you Mm. mentioned, Mm. this group confirmed that they will come back to the animal after a couple of days, if need be, if they need more to get more meat off of it. Right. 
And I think it's a good time too to point out that a lot of the research, especially from the early 2000s forward, comes out of the University of Florida. There, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Mel Sunquist at the University of Florida. He's now a emeritus professor. He specialized in studying carnivores and felids and canids and bears and and but he's basically known as a tiger guy in Florida. And funny fact, Chris. <laughs> Many uh, moons ago, yes. uh, circa, I think, 2010, when <laughs> we John was relocating to Florida and I was looking at going back to grad school mm-hmm. and looking at the University of Florida and different programs I could apply to, I sent emails to sev- several professors expressing interest in <clears throat> their program or at least to <laughs> come down and meet them and see if I would be a good fit for grad school and uh, a and, and lot, but... Funny mm-hmm, story. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Sunquist had already retired, had just recently retired. So he never responded to my email, uh, but a young researcher God. named Dr. <laughs> Chris Morrison God. did respond to my email and, uh, we met and had a kind of informal interview and so goes the story. But yeah, you were almost yeah. swooped by Dr. Sunquist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, my life would be so different. It would honestly uh, be so too. different. Mine too. I would have been like it, it studying be, tigers in Asia or something. I know. Um, but no, everything works out. For- <laughs> <laughs> Instead, but you're a mom. You have two beautiful boys, a beautiful husband, beautiful uh, home. It worked out yes. like it was supposed to. Yes, but, we all. Oh, I my was, life would be so I was, different, and, and, yes, and not I a good was way. Meant to study ungulates, but you know, you got to cast yeah. when you're trying to get into grad yes. school. You got to cast a big net, no, right? You, you can't. You you, you, you can't just uh, yeah. go for yeah. go for one. And I went for like twenty, and you were the yeah. lucky one that took the bait. And I'm the only <laughs> yeah. one. <laughs> I'm the only one that took the bait. That's the thing. I was the only one dumb uh, enough. No, Angie was amazing. Well, you, you and Doctor Warren, you guys were a team. You both. You guys. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. convinced you mm-hmm. so but yeah so I, I i would like to give a shout out to dr uh, mel sunquist and all the research efforts he he's at every encyclopedia and book and research out there mm-hmm. his team mm-hmm. did amazing amazing work on carnivore behavior and physiology uh yeah 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 so i wanted to jump into the study because this was one of the rabbit holes i went down and it was a really interesting study in the, the zoological society of london in their journal, and it was prey abundance and prey selection by tigers in a semi-arid, dry, deciduous forest in Western India. And we have listeners in India, so shout out to them. You know, this is in their backyards. That they were looking at prey abundance and then really preference what tigers preferred to hunt uh, in that area of the world. So this was conducted in 2000, 2001. And they basically were analyzing the poop. Yay. I love poop. I got to talk about poop in my anatomy and physiology class this week. They're all looking at me. (laughs) This is what you could have been doing. And then one one, one, one girl raised her hand. She's like, can you tell me why poop is either green or yellow sometimes? And I was like, yes, a student after my own heart. No, I can't give you the answer off the top of my head. <laughs> something to do with something you ate. <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, yeah it was diet. Funny. Yeah, yeah. Most of the students could care oh, less. Gosh. They're like, why Anyways. is my teacher talking about poop so yeah. much? Because it's awesome. But go ahead. Because you, you learn a lot. You learn a lot. So this could have been you in grad school going around collecting tiger poop in the middle of the jungle, like you imagine. And so they, in my next life, Chris, definitely. Yeah, I know. I know. So they went and compared, you know, over a hundred samples and looked at what was in it, you know, what, what they ate. So they, in the area, the, the axis deer or spotted deer in India is, was the most abundant as far as what was there. They had common langers, uh, the sambar deer, the N- Nagali antelope, which is really cool. We should probably cover that someday. Huge antelope in, in Asia, wild pigs or some gazelle, right? So those are the things that were generally out there for the tigers to hunt. Overwhelmingly, Angie, what do you think they ate? Lingers? Pigs? Deer? Antelope? Pigs. No, deer. By far. So the, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So the, the most common was the sambar deer and 47% of the scat that they looked at had uh, samples of, of that. 31% 31% had the axis or spotted deer. So that was the preferred over, was that 78% of the diet was preferred to be that. So I thought that was kind of cool. 
So yeah. they really like those ungulates. They're tasty. You know, it's, it's that venison is just, even though well, who doesn't like a good, or, never mind. <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> big barbecue. Yeah. yeah. Well, that or I wonder if maybe they're, I don't, are they easier to catch or maybe they're catching younger ones that are more abundant probably. Yeah. yeah it's probably, a, it's probably yeah. a density yeah. type thing. That's yeah. the thing with science. You answer one question and it yeah. leads to so many more. And that's why we love right. it so much. Right. Right. Now, tigers, their behavior. Here's one thing I found and I'm going to let you run because I thought this was cool because this is something you can look at your, your cats at home. So they do, and Angie's going to talk about all the different ways they communicate, but one way, I don't know if you talked about their tails and how they, their tails, use their tails to communicate. So a tiger, if their tail's loosely hanging, they're pretty relaxed. Okay. When it's rapidly going side to side, and I've seen this in Jay and some of the other cats I've had in my lifetime, when it goes side to side, they're a little bit aggressive or it's like they're hunting, right? Or if it's low, like, you know, when they hold it low and then they whip it to the side real quick, you know, mm -hmm. that's again, a, a sign of aggression or they're getting ready to hunt. So tigers do that. And then your little kitty cats at home do that too. Right. Yeah. Well, and just like your little kitty cats at home, tigers sleep a long time, about 18 to 20 hours a day. And they don't really have a preference. They'll sleep on rocks or in grass. Uh, they'll sleep next to their prey if they need to take a break. They just will sleep wherever, which is kind of like my my cat. Mm -hmm. My kitty cats at home <laughs> will have a few favorite spots, but in general, I've found them in some really random, weird places. Uh, and as we previously mentioned, unlike any other big cat, tigers are really powerful swimmers, and they've been known to swim great distances to hunt or cross rivers. And of course, young tigers will often play in water. Adults will lounge in the water. I can get behind that, right? Half half my yeah. body in the water, half my body yeah. out in the sun with a little margarita or something. You know? <laughs> Stay nice and cool on a hot day. Yep. We, could, we could all get behind that pool lounging behavior. So that is very interesting. That sets them apart from a lot of the other big cats that, of course, do not like water. Your little kitty at home, if you ever try to give him a bath, mm -hmm. nope. does not like nope. water. I'm sure there's some there now. There's some odd. I've seen a few YouTube videos of cats that like water, so or kitty cats that like it. So there's yeah. a there's yeah. a few, you know there's always an odd one in the group. But in general, most cats, uh, uh, most big cats, and of course our domestic kitty cats don't like water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as Chris mentioned earlier, where they're hunting, they are mostly solitary, uh, and they don't form any real true bonds except for between mother and offspring. And because of their hunting and, and the prey that they hunt, they really have large territories and the size will actually be determined by the abundance of the prey. So when we, when we talk about conservation in my interview with Dr. Sonarto, it's very interesting to learn how big their territory is and that because of that and the prey of how much land is needed to quote unquote, have a healthy population mm -hmm. um, to keep them safe. And that's why habitat loss, degradation, fragmentation, building up of all these urban cities um, is really troublesome for tigers. So that's one of the big differences too, because people are like, well, what are the differences? Between, you know, what are the quick differences between tigers and lions besides looks? Mm -hmm. Well, number one, mm -hmm. lions live in Africa and tigers live in Asia. But I think the second biggest one is that tigers don't live in permanent groups. They don't have a pride. So if you are at your local accredited zoo and you see a tiger by itself, don't think that it's lonely or that it wants a friend. It actually doesn't want a friend. And it only wants a friend during that breeding time, which we're going to talk, we'll talk about that. So it's, it's similar to domestic cats. I would say in that way, uh, my dear husband, John, bless his heart. He made that mistake with one of his, with a cat. He mm -hmm. thought, Oh, I'll get another one. So they have a buddy and those cats never really ever got along. So cats will tolerate each other. A lot of multiple cats living in a home, but, most kitty cats would probably prefer to live by themselves, just like their cousin, the tiger. 
And Chris, I just want to correct myself really quick. I did mention that the biggest difference is between tigers and lions is that lions are from Africa and tigers are from Asia. And that's a general truth, but there is a small population of Asiatic lions. So yeah. in one part, if, you know, a, a, yeah. a scientist like to be <laughs> perfect. Course, I know, I know. Perfect I know. and technical. Yeah. So, but yeah. yes, I will. And I guess. I think the the biggest – everybody knows lions come from Africa. Uh, not mm-hmm. we'll, we'll have to cover the Asiatic lion so people can learn more about that. Mm-hmm. I think the misnomer I feel like I hear a lot of, uh, and maybe it's just the little kids I hang around, mm-hmm. but that tigers are in Africa, and that's definitely not the case. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Evolved in Asia. Covered that yes. in part one. Yep. Mm-hmm, yep. Mm-hmm. And – you touched on their tail communication, which is cool because it definitely mm-hmm. reminded me of my kitty cats at home and how they mm-hmm. kind of move their tail depending on what their body language is saying and if they're happy or hunting or angry. But they have a lot of different ways to communicate with each other and mark their territory or find females. And and so individuals will mar- mark their domain with urine, feces, scrapes on trees or in the dirt and of course vocalizing Mm -hmm. and so probably one of the more similar ways that they communicate is through scent marking and they have a odorous musk musky liquid that's mixed in with the urine and can be sprayed on objects like trees grass and rocks and anybody Mm -hmm. who's not neutered a male cat knows that this cat spray is Mix, it's mixed nasty. with urine, but it's nastier, right? It's definitely yeah, musky yeah. and has its own unique smell. Yeah. And then, Chris, this is you're going to love this. Mm. Tigers, in order to smell all these pheromones and hormones and mm. different things in the urine and feces, mm. they will do a flemin. Yep, I've seen it. Yep, which is what we talk about in horses all the time. Horses, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where the tongue will hang over the incisors and the nose wrinkles and the upper canines are bared. And they basically are trying to really just sniff, really get those, Mm -hmm. that smell, those odor molecules, because every different Mm. hormone and pheromones have a different Mm. chemical signature into Mm. their nasal organ and into the receptors in their nasal to try to figure out what it is. So I thought that was kind of a, that's bringing my tiger world and ungulate world together, right? And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by doing this, they can decide if a tigress is an estrus or if it's one of their cubs or if it's a male down the road. And of course, they communicate visually by making scrapes in trees or on other objects. And just like your kitty cat at home, they also have very obvious facial features or movements of Mm -hmm. their face that can be described as a defensive threat. When I'm giving my cat her medication at home, she mm-hmm. makes this face. Yes. And it's yeah. it's basically they pull the corners of their mouth back, expose their canines, flat those flat ears. You know, if you see those flat mm-hmm. ears on your kitty cat at yeah. home, you're in trouble. And they enlarge their pupils. So it's yeah. So you know, you know by that face. And mm-hmm. so yep. do, yep. yeah. You know, yep. And so do that's how they communicate with each other. And then, of course, I think some of the most iconic way that they communicate is vocally. And they have a list of different vocalizations from a roar to a growl to a snar, grunt, moan, meow, hisses. Of -hmm. course, the famous chuff. So Mm -hmm. each sound has its purpose and it appears to reflect what the tiger's thinking, their intent, their mood. Uh, A tiger will roar as a sign of dominance and it tells its neighbor, the other male, how big it is, what its location is, whereas a moan is going to be more submissive. So, and there's everything mm-hmm. in between. And you can hear a tiger roar from up to two miles away. Yeah, far, far. That's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, I, yeah. You're talking vocalizations, Angie. Do they purr? Oh, what do you Inquire think? Fire minds want to know. No. Correct. Okay, yeah, I didn't think they did. <laughs> they just the have tig- the, they just have crazy sounds, yeah, the chuff. They do. They obviously have a very mm-hmm. wide range, wide berth of mm-hmm. vocalizations, mm-hmm. and the ability for them to roar so loud comes from having what they call flexible hyoid apparatus. And so the hyoid mm-hmm. is this bone that's not; it's the only floating bone in your body. It's not attached mm-hmm. to anything else. Your tongue attaches to it, 
and they have vocal cords with very thick fibroelastic pads that makes the sound reverberate and travel really long distances. And so in big cats, so lions, tigers, leopards, leopards, and jaguars, this length of this tough cartilage that runs up the hyoid bone and then connects to the skull basically prevents the purring. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it is flexible enough to allow for a full, what they call full throated roar, very loud roar, which our cats make noises, but nothing, of course, our, our kitty cats at home make noises, but of course, nothing like a tiger roar. Uh, and so do you know the one big cat or bigger cat that can purr? Um, oh, geez. Isn't the cheetah? Ah, very good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, and I did my you, homework. <laughs> you did. And now do you know why, why do our little kitties at home and cheetahs purr? Um, I think it's a sign of content, right? Like just, they're just content. It's kind of a trick question, Chris. Nobody really knows. Yeah. knows. <laughs> so, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's theories out there. Yeah. Uh, no one yeah. really knows why they evolved this ability. Um, yeah. some researchers speculate that when a mother cat purrs, it might help camouflage the little mewing, the little squeaky mewings of her kittens, of her nursing kittens. And because that the sound of the little kittens might attract a predator, but if they make this content purring noise, it would drown out or that noise would blend in. So the other theory is some veterinarians have suggested that purring is actually maybe helping them heal when they're injured because they will Mm -hmm. purr even when they're in pain sometimes. And so it's thought that at these really low frequency purr vibrations might be a natural healing mechanism. It might help okay. strengthen repaired bones or relieve pain or wound or, or even help heal wounds. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the jury's still out, but we all, we all, I know I love it when my cat purrs. I know that I, I know that she's seems content at least in that, yes. at, at yeah, that stage. Content. So yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. So just to sum up everything, so solitary, I, I mean, I, I have an idea, you know, and, and I understand cats and carnivores and, and you know, we've covered this in some species. I don't know why honey badger comes to my mind, overlapping territories, but can you talk some of the breeding strategies, you know, with, with being a solitary female with solitary males, mm-hmm. you know, how they meet up, how they mate, stuff like that. So, Chris, in tiger world, it's typically the female that advertises her readiness to mate. It's based on her hormonal profile, based on her being in what we call estrus, having high levels of estrogen that will then signal the male, okay, it's time to no longer be solitary. Let's come together. And female tigers come into estrus every three to nine weeks. And when they are under this high dose of estrogen circulating, they can be what's considered receptive for three to six days. And so when a female is an estrus, she may frequently vocalize to attract the male. And when they come across each other, they'll begin this courtship of circling each other and vocalizing. The male will sniff probably her genital region or if she's urinated or defecated nearby. And he'll do that phlegm in response to check, to check to make sure that she is an estrus. And then copulation is usually brief and repeated for a couple days. We've talked about this on the podcast before, but tigers, just like our little kitties at home, are what they call induced ovulators. So that means the actual physical act of breeding is what will cause the female to release an egg for fertilization. So several days after mating, she'll ovulate. And it guarantees it's going to be fresh and there's fresh semen in the tract waiting for her Mm -hmm. and egg and sperm will be united. Mm -hmm. Now, and tigers are promiscuous. And so both male and female tigers will have several mates over their lifetimes. And when male and female do come together and a female gets pregnant, her gestation period is about 103 days. 
It varies from subspecies to subspecies a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she's going to give birth anywhere from one to three cubs. But on average, it's two to three. And Mm -hmm. a female, this is also really key to point out for their conservation, is that a female tiger will give birth to two to four cubs on average every two years. So... It's not that frequent as you might think as uh, like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as your kitty at home, right? We all know, you know, we, yeah, yeah. we've all experienced that neighbor or somebody, that relative that yeah. won't spare new year's a cat and a, and a cat will produce more litters, but a tiger, that's not common. And in the sad fact that one cub won't make it a second lighter then can be produced, but mm-hmm. it's not always the case. So, yeah. And it's also important to note, too, that when the newborn cubs, when they're born, anybody that's nursed little kittens back to health, just like your domestic cat, they're born blind and helpless. It's all tritial. And they're tiny. They're like 780 to 1,600 grams. The eyes don't open until about 6 to 14 days after birth. And then the ears, too, like 9 to 11 days after birth. So they're really vulnerable at this point in time and, you know, very, very tiny and very needy. And so, and so I have to say that female tigers, those tigresses out there, they are super moms. They're my super mom they of are. the month they for, are. Sh- for yes, sure. They are. Uh, and I'll be a tiger mom. I they're like not, that. They're not, ca- they're not cassowaries. <laughs> no. <laughs> they're not cassowaries. <laughs> yeah. Just no. abandoned <laughs> the nest. See ya. I'm I know here. those mom cassowaries. Sometimes I want, <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes I want to be a tiger mom and sometimes I want to be a cassowary mom. It just depends on, uh, the day and, and my <laughs> kids' day, behavior. Yeah. <laughs> how, how yeah, many, yeah. uh, it depends on the weather and my kids' behavior and how tired I am from work, if I have to podcast or not. Uh, but no. Yep. So the cubs are typically weaned around three to six months, but the female is the sole provider for them until they reach independence for about up to about two years of age. I know. I know. I know. And evolutionary, and evolutionarily speaking, I think it's because it takes a long time for young tigers to learn how to stalk and attack and Mm -hmm. specialize in killing their prey and they learn it Mm -hmm. all from mom and so the other thing that makes a tiger mom a super mom is that during this time no you know tiger dad he he did his deed he he's done he's Mm -hmm. he's on to the Mm -hmm. next one Mm -hmm. not involved at all uh So the mother is caring for these cubs. She has to increase her killing rate by 50% in order to get enough nutrition to satisfy herself and her offspring. So she's taking care of her cubs and then also herself and doing all this extra hunting, which, I mean, let's do the math here, Chris. So we're saying Mm -hmm. one out of 10 to 20 hunts. Right. So now she's got to double it to get two out of. 20 to 30, right? Type deal. So, yeah, and, and protecting her young and protecting her territory and teaching her and young, right? Stuff. The issue, yeah. <laughs> I, I can just picture, I'm sure there's some beautiful documentaries out there, but I can just, mm-hmm. I've seen some of like mothers trying to train <laughs> the mm-hmm. little ones and they're yeah. just like the worst students ever. They're bopping around <laughs> playing with each other. Yeah. So, you know, when she's training them how to hunt when they're little like that, they're actually not successful because <laughs> the, yeah. the, yep, tiger, yep, the yep, tiger cubs yep. are ruining it for her. It's like, me, around, yeah. it's like yeah. me in the grocery store with my kids. I'm trying oh, to like, yeah. I've got my grocery list and I'm trying to follow yeah. my healthy crock pot recipe and the kids are with me <laughs> yeah. and they're knocking stuff over and trying to get Oreos, which Rabbit are not on the list and just yeah. making, making it not very efficient. So I've, uh, my girlfriend, Tristy taught me, it's best to go to the grocery store at eight o'clock at night after they've gone to bed. So that's a trick for all you new moms out there. It's a lot more, a lot more, always, a lot more efficient, but tiger mom doesn't, the real tiger mom doesn't have that ability, right? So she works very mm-hmm, hard. Mm-hmm. And, but when she raises them up and they're about two years old, they're off on their own. And, and young tigers don't reach sexual maturity until they're about three to four years of age for a female and four to five for a male. Mm -hmm. So when we talk Mm -hmm. about life cycle and. Yeah. And then you look at their generation interval. I mean, they're only living 10 to 15 years. So, and she's breeding every two to three years. She's not producing. It's not like cats 
you know, feral cats here where they're producing kittens left and right, it's, it's a long time. So when they're at a critical mass, which we're going to get to here in a second, you know, it's, it's tough for them to recover. Yes. Their population. It's Saiga, right? <laughs> yes. I read an interesting yeah. paper uh, when I was getting into the weeds about tigers and populations and then rebounding. And there was a study about Siberian tigers back in 2003, looking at, reproductive parameters right up our alley, Chris, you would like this paper. I'll send mm -hmm, it to you mm -hmm. of wild female Siberian tigers. And basically it summarized that after looking at all the data of all those numbers that we talk about as far as how, how old is the female when she first gets pregnant? What's her litter size? What's her breeding interval from year to year mm -hmm. and the survival rate of the cubs. But basically and looking at all the data, the researchers concluded that tiger populations don't rebound that well. Mm -hmm. And that previous data from 10, 20 years prior that had talked about, oh, well, if we just do this and this, they'll rebound. It'll be great. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Was not accurate. And that's yeah. why we do research, right? We, we don't just do search. Mm -hmm. We do yeah, research. We, do, yeah. we keep redoing it to make sure our numbers are correct based on current situations and current habitats and all these different things. And so, and that's the general consensus now is that a lot of places and a lot of countries are putting protective measures in place. And we'll touch on that here shortly. Yeah. But that's not enough. The numbers aren't just going to magically skyrocket because it's a long generation interval. It's pretty long. Yeah. Time. Right. And it's tough being a tiger out there. Uh, so mm -hmm. we need to put an extra effort if we're, if we're going to see their population increase, which yeah, yeah. many organizations are doing. Yeah. Yeah. we're going to get to an organization here in a minute, but you know, just looking at their conservation status a hundred years ago, Angie, there was a hundred thousand tigers in Asia. That's down to what a high of 3,800, but probably around 3,200, somewhere in between there. You know, that's what they're estimating. So, of that population, only about a thousand or probably like 1,200 are breeding females. So, one, you know, not a ton. That is a tiny, tiny, that's a population. teeny, tiny, tiny amount. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny. So if we break it down by subspecies, and this was off the IUCN, and these are just, just estimates, and we, we thought that it's a little dated, but this is the best data we have. So the Bengal tiger is the most populous with 2,500, and it's it's still classified as endangered. Sumatran tiger was next, and there's about a, a thousand left, but they're critically endangered because they're decreasing. The Siberian tiger, they're stable, but there's only about 540 left, nothing. Indo-Chinese tiger, 250 left, stable, but they're endangered. South China tiger, probably extinct in the wild. They haven't seen them in 25 years. And like I said, there's some under human care. And the Malayan tiger, they, they max, max 120 and they're critically <sighs> endangered. Yeah. So it's, it's a sad story, but here's the good news. The 13 countries that really have tigers have come together, and, and you talked about this in, in your interview, that they want to double the world's tiger population by 2022. So they're yes. hoping by the, when the Asian calendar, it's the year of the tiger, they want to have at least 6,000 tigers in the wild. That's the hope. And this is a workshop that they had in 2009. So like you said, World Wildlife Fund, we're nearing 4,000. So we're hoping to get up to that 6,000 number. Uh, in just three years, which I don't know if we'll reach it, but you know, they're pushing hard and these countries are behind it. Yeah. And we'll put, we'll put a lot of show notes up, uh, mm -hmm. about basically it's called, it's called the global tiger Re recovery program or TX2 or tiger X2 tiger mm -hmm. by two, uh, doubling, doubling the wild number of tigers by 2022. So right. there's lots of groups. I mean, 13 different range companies, and as you said, 13 different range countries coming together, working through red tape, different governments, different international issues and things like that. And of course, a lot of like NGOs and nonprofit organizations really, really pushing for these guys and trying to protect their habitat, right. monitor, right. monitor the tigers themselves or prey, reduce poaching, increase education. So it's a good group and it's definitely uh, worthy to tip our hats to them. 
here's some of the benefits of supporting tiger research. So this was, this came out last year, 2018 in biological conservation. And it's the ecological benefits of tigers to farmers in reducing crop and livestock losses in the Eastern Himalayas. So it was a study looking at the impacts tigers had on these farmers because in these, you know, biodiverse rich countries, these emerging, you know, economies, developing world, a lot of these farmers have some negative interactions with wildlife and it impacts their, their survival or livelihood, right? So just for an example, in Bhutan, 70% of the population are just subsistence farmers, just trying to survive. Each year, crop and livestock losses account for 20% of their income. So they lose 20% of their income each year to wildlife. Okay, so there's a huge, this is where we see a lot of human wildlife conflict. So in this study, what they wanted to do was look how carnivores affected that. And farmers hate large carnivores. You know, probably they're scared of them, but they also think they're, they're impacting their farming. You know, livestock losses, things like that. We've seen this in Africa. We see this in South America, even in the United States. Oh, wolves. yeah. The, with the red wolves we yeah. see here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Or the gray wolves in Montana and stuff. And so, so what this study was looking at was, okay, how does it affect the farmer if there's tigers in the area versus tigers not in the area? It's just, this was an amazing study that a lot of these farmers experienced a lot of crop losses due to herbivores. You know, these deer that we're talking about, these antelope that are come in and eat their crops. And that's where they, they suffer a lot of losses. So what happens is when there are not tigers in there, okay, the other predators, the leopards, and then this one, the doles, the Asiatic wild dogs, which is mm-hmm. yeah, we got to cover them. They are definitely on my list. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when there are no tigers, they go deeper in the in the forest where the tigers would normally be, and so the farmers they put out their livestock, okay, and they let them graze or forage in these forests. So they became the number one target for these leopards and doles. So they suffered a lot of livestock losses. When there was tigers in the area or tigers were there, it pushed the leopards and doles closer to the croplands. It's it really, crit- it's an amazing study if you think about it. So when there's a tiger deep in the jungle or deep in the forest, these other predators are like, hey, I'm not messing with them. I'm going to go to this area, which happened to be around the croplands. Well, what that did is it drove away the herbivores. So they, in essence, were protecting the crops. Now, a tiger would occasionally take livestock, but not as in great numbers as the leopards or doles. So when you had, so the bottom line of this study was when there were tigers in the area, it benefited the farmers because in essence, it drove other predators away from their livestock and somewhat protected them. I mean, would, would event, you know, sometimes take one and then the governments are reimbursing these farmers. Yeah. There's some neat program incentive programs to help reimburse for livestock loss, but it drove the predators to another area that protected the crops. So the farmers benefited greatly. And there was a lot of things, you know, and this is basic research, you know, does correlation form causation. And they really address that in the study that they're really confident in this data. So what they want to do is like we saw in Nepal in the snow leopard study, we talked about, I think on a conservation news segment, which by the way, folks, we're going to be returning to that here soon. We've got some announcements coming up, but that it, when you get the locals bought in, that's when conservation works, right? Of course. So this study was critical, critical. I just, oh, it was just amazing. I was just like, wow. So I'll, I'll, I'll put this on the show notes so people can actually go and read it. it, it it's online and you can kind of read the study if you're really inter- interested in it. Yeah. Well, I think but, that's, a, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing that these conservation heroes and scientists are doing is they're not just making stuff up. They're actually looking at, looking yeah. at the numbers and looking at data mm-hmm. and approaching it from all different angles to try to figure out how to better manage the tigers. Mm-hmm of course, on, uh, and how much room they need and, uh, w- can they live, can they live in harmony with the farmers and things like that? Like how can a tiger exist in the modern world? How much land do they mm-hmm. need? Things like that. And these mm-hmm. pop, 
these studies are critical. And not only that, but like you said, education is key, key, key of to help get locals on board and to show them that basically the tigers aren't doing as much damage as they had previously yeah. probably or yeah. historically yeah. thought. So right. I'm highlighting the World Wildlife Fund and all the amazing conservation work they do for tigers. With this campaign to, to double the number of wild tigers by 2022, it's just incredible. And the work, mm -hmm. having intimate conversations with uh, Sunarto and learning about all the different ways they are helping do this and what their money is going towards. And it's just incredible. So you got to check out that interview. But briefly, they are protecting and connecting tiger habitat because there's fragmented land. So that's not helpful. If a male can't find mm -hmm. a female, how are they going to breed? And so they're not only protecting mm -hmm. it, but they're also figuring out how to connect it. And in the interview, Sonarto discusses how they're monitoring tigers and their prey, which is really cool and very difficult because they are stealthy animals. They are not, they do most of their activities at night. So it's a lot of uh, camera traps and things like that. And mm -hmm. the, the, hoops that the researchers have to jump through, let alone the hikes that they have to go on to get into some of these dense forests is just incredible. And that's what World Wildlife Fund does is support these tiger experts and conservationists to mm -hmm. get out there and collect this hard, raw data that then drives their conservation plans and goals. And mm -hmm. the other big thing too is that they, uh, they partner with a lot of political important people in these 13 range countries where tigers still are around and that just takes a lot of finesse and skill set because i mean 13 different countries that's different cultures different languages different rules different laws regulations and so the other thing too that the world wildlife fund does really well is they build political partners and so they're working across 13 different range countries with different governments so i can't even I can't, our own one government here in the United States know, can't even work together. <laughs> so <laughs> imagine yeah. trying to be um, a person that's working with 13 different countries and we're talking 13 different languages and 13 different expectations about yeah. tigers and cultural and history, all these different things. And so they really help identify problems and solutions to help basically figure out economic and environmental solutions for the future. And lastly, World Wildlife Fund is committed to eliminating tiger trade. They know mm -hmm. they have global programs, one's called Traffic, uh, they have wildlife monitoring networks. They are trying to stop these criminals from the ground up and the bigger networks and the, and the poaching rings and all of this stuff. And so it's, it's a huge undertaking and they have specialists in different areas doing each different things. And so, like I said, I was lucky enough to get to talk to Snarto about the mo mm. the actual on the ground monitoring and educating of the local people, which is super fascinating. So mm. if you're not a, fa a fan or supporter of World Wild Wildlife oh, please, Fund, now is the time. You can adopt amazing. a tiger. Yeah. I mean, a few bucks. You could or like them on Facebook, Instagram, yeah. follow yeah. them. Just follow them, yeah. Check out our interview, share them. our interview with Sonarto, spread the word, yeah. spread the knowledge, because they're doing great things and they should be recognized for the and any any help you can give them either through educating more people or financially yeah. would be greatly improved. Because if we protect tigers, we protect ourselves. It's true. It's true. And I you know, my conservation tips this week, the number one thing you can do for tigers is education. Share this episode with your friends. I mean, tigers are beloved all around the world. Our friends in India that are listening and Asia that are listening, please share this episode. I think that is a great place that we can make some sort of impact because we really need to develop a global movement on saving these animals. So that's my number one tip. Now, how you can specifically today or tomorrow or when you go shopping next, there's two things you can do to help support tigers and tiger habitat. And we've said it before, and I'm going to say it again, two issues, sustainable palm oil and the use of sustainable wood products. There's two things you can do in this World Wildlife Fund that they actually hunted down the connection between the United States here 
and the use of products developed in the tropical forest in Sumatra. So what they're asking is look for products like tissues that are used, that are recycled. And there is the Forest Stewardship Council, and I'll link this on the show notes, FSC that will stamp reusable products or use sustainable products. So I am going to, anytime I go shopping now, I'm going to be looking for that stamp. The other thing was sustainable palm oil. And Angie and I talked about this in the orangutan episode and others. The RSPO certifies palm oil producers. Now there's a whole mess with palm oil right now, but this is the best thing we've got right now. Either use that app, the palm oil sustainable app, or RSPO certified that they're going in and certifying producers that they're minimizing their impact on the environment as far as the tiger orangutan and the other species environment there. Because as Angie has said so many times, and it's so true, our purchasing power makes a huge statement. And these companies in the United States and abroad need to know we are not going to allow it anymore. We're not going to buy your products. Absolutely, Chris. And that was something else you can do from your couch or with your wonderful handy dandy um, social media, iPhone, Android device is you can vote with your dollar, of course, but you can also vote with your voice and not just here in the United States. For instance, at last October, October 29th, 2018, it was big news. China decided to lift its ban on the use of tiger and rhino parts. This ban had been in place for many, many years, uh, 25 years, um, and they decided to lift this ban and allow some tiger parts and rhino parts to be used in traditional medicine. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. Well, wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah. After a huge public outcry, it took about 13 days. Yeah. 14 days. I forget how many days are in October. Mm-hmm. On November 13th, 2018, they rescinded this lifted ban. Warms they, my heart. Warms mm-hmm. my heart. <laughs> they rescinded the ban. And said that they would take further look at it. And so now we're in the the spring of 2019. And so Mm -hmm. far, they haven't reinstated the... uh, the, So far, it's still banned in China. It's holding, yeah. It's holding. Mm -hmm. But clearly, the young generation, the people on social media, this a huge public outcry can go a long way. And so there are... Rather, they're the surveys that go around or the legislation votes or make your voice be heard, of course, vocally, but then also financially, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, I just want to end on one happy note. I want to give a shout out to Nepal. I haven't been. Yes. Um, my dear friend Cassie studied abroad there years ago mm-hmm. um, when we were back at Michigan State and just loved the country and showed me pictures of it. And I need to go. It's on my bucket list. Mm-hmm. But as of September 2018... Nepal is on track to become the first one of those range countries, those 13 range Mm -hmm. countries that are trying to double the amount of wild tigers. It's on track to become the first one to double its tiger population since 2010. They're amazing. Nepal's doing amazing work in conservation. Yeah. So, oh, I just got goosebumps. So kudos to, if we have any Nepal listeners, I think we've had like one download. So (laughs) yeah. Maybe we'll get have some more. <laughs> maybe we'll have some more. Uh, but yeah. thank you, thank you, Nepal. And it's so it, it, there is hope when when countries get together and people get together and the conservation heroes out in the field, conservation heroes like yourselves that are sharing mm-hmm. and educating and yes. voting with your yes. voice, voting with your dollar, supporting conservation organizations, helping these animals out in the wild, be it. Financially, if you can do that, awesome. But if you can't, just support them through their education and other means or just follow them and like them on social media. Mm -hmm. Stay, you know, we live in this connected digital media world. Just stay in touch. Follow some of these sites and, and you'll learn. And then you share that knowledge with more people and get more people talking about it. And that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to do this. That's how we're going to get these, these wild tigers 
thriving in the wild. I believe in it. Yes. Yes, I do too. I do too. It, it's true. And we're, and you know, we're going to keep building up steam and, and do that. Now I promised you at the beginning about the masks and Angie is very skeptical. I saw her <laughs> like, Nope, that doesn't work. So here's the truth, Angie. It does work. It does. That if you wear a, a mask, like a human face on the back of your head, it works. It thwarts tigers for a few months. And then they figure it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's 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 kind of controversial, but but the people have said that you know the tigers, it kind of scares them off at first, but then after like five or six months, they figure it out, and they're like, wait a minute, and they're like, no, and then charge. So, and they're pretty smart. That that's is, for sure. That is anecdotal evidence that it actually does work initially, but then the tiger gets wise, and because they're pretty smart. And they're like, wait a minute, you're walking the wrong way or whatever. <laughs> and so then they go and, sorry, they chomp something. But anyways, oh my goodness, Angie, what a great two weeks. I mean, what a great two weeks. Two awesome interviews, two awesome episodes on one of the, the most iconic species on Earth. I uh, We're going to have to have John back talking about tigers. Maybe we'll just bring him on to talk about tigers for an hour. Because he could, he could just, I just say, John, talk tigers and I'll well, just Well, and I got and pumped up about the dole and the Asiatic lion. So yeah. now we have lots more species to do. So, oh, yes. I know. There's so many. There's so many. We have, we'll never run out of material. So, anyways, great job, Angie. We're going to save the world. We're going to save tigers. We're going to really save wildlife. So let's keep doing what well, we're doing. Well, we're not going to do it. Week. Our listeners are going to do it. We're just, that's gonna, true. We're going to help. That's true. It's, it's all, them. <laughs> it's teamwork. There's no I in team, right? Yes. No, there's no nope, we in nope, team, there, right? No, nope. you are our heroes, the people listening that have listened for, for two hours plus about tigers. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back next week with another amazing species. Thank you, everyone. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.